even if you don't know very much about wine, there are likely a few wine grapes you've heard of. Cabernet, Pinot Noir, Merlot. I am not drinking any Merlot. One grape you're likely familiar with is Chardonnay, and for good reason. Chardonnay is the fifth most grown wine grape in the world, and among the top five, it's the only one widely used for making white table wines. If you're on a plane or a similar setting where your wine options are just red and white, the white is usually Chardonnay. Some famous French wines are made with this grape, including Champagne and Chablis, and Chardonnay is grown in many countries around the world, but this ubiquity came at a cost. Negative attitudes towards Chardonnay started developing among wine drinkers in the 1980s, and some of these attitudes persist to this day. So what happened? Why do some wine drinkers ask for anything but Chardonnay? In this FevGeek video, we're going to find out how Chardonnay got its bad rap. First, let's learn about the grape. Chardonnay is a white vinifera grape native to the Burgundy region of France. It gets its name from a commune in the Maconnais district in the southern part of Burgundy. It's one of the older grapes in France, but recent genetic testing revealed that it is a cross between two older grapes, Pinot Noir and Gouet Blanc. Chardonnay is a favorite among wine producers for three reasons. First, Chardonnay is a versatile grape. It can grow in a variety of climates and conditions. It thrives in its native home of Burgundy, where the weather is cooler, but can also grow in much warmer climates. As far as vinifera grapes go, it's easy to cultivate, making it a very forgiving grape for vineyards to work with. It's also a grape that adapts to its environment, leading to a variety of wine styles and flavors. While low in aromatics, Chardonnay does contain high amounts of malic acid. This acid is found naturally in many other fruits, such as apples, pears, stone fruits such as peaches and apricots, and tropical fruits such as pineapples and mangoes. Malic acid contributes to the sour flavor in these fruits, as it does in Chardonnay grapes. Different growing environments lead to the development of different flavors in Chardonnay wines. In cooler climates, the flavors tend to lead towards apples and pears. As the climate gets warmer, peaches and other stone fruit come through, and as the climate gets even warmer, tropical fruit flavors come out. Chardonnay also lends itself well to a variety of different winemaking techniques. Chardonnay can go through a process called malolactic fermentation, or MLF, where lactic acid bacteria, such as Enococcus eni, converts the malic acid into lactic acid, commonly found in dairy products. This fermentation also creates a chemical called diacetyl, which gives it a buttery flavor. As a result of MLF, the sour flavors in Chardonnay get toned down and creamy flavors are added. Chardonnay wines also hold up well to oak aging. The vanillin present in toasted oak barrels can add vanilla and smoky flavors to the wine, and helps to round out its texture. Chardonnay can also benefit from aging on lees, where dead yeast remain in the wine during the aging process. This adds toasty and nutty flavors to the wine. Chardonnay is not only made in still wines, but is also made in sparkling wines such as the Blanc de Blancs from Champagne and even sweet dessert wines. As mentioned, Chardonnay got its start in Burgundy, where it's the most cultivated white wine grape in the region. Chardonnay is used to make some of Burgundy's most well-known whites, such as Chablis. Hailing from the Chablis region in the north of Burgundy, these wines tend to be brighter, with flavors leaning towards apple and pear, with mineral notes present. Less oak is used there, allowing the fruit to shine. Further south in Maconnais, the climate is slightly warmer, and the wines tend to have bigger flavors of peach and pineapple. Between these two areas is Cote de Bone, where oak aging is used more liberally, leading to richer wines. The Chardonnay grape would find its way to other areas of France and of Europe. Significant plantings of Chardonnay are present in the wine-drinking nations of Italy and Spain. As cultivation of vinifera grapes spread outside Europe, Chardonnay would be one of the top white grapes grown. Some of the top producing wine countries outside Europe, such as Australia, South Africa, Argentina, and Chile, grow large amounts of Chardonnay. So too does the United States, where it is the nation's most grown wine grape. So. How did Chardonnay develop a bad reputation? To explain, we'll go back to the United States in the late 1960s. It was around this time that the first baby boomers were reaching adulthood, and their tastes differed from that of their parents. While older generations of Americans preferred beer and liquor, the boomers wanted to try new things, and one of the things they went for was wine. Starting in 1968, the per capita consumption of wine in the United States skyrocketed. As a result, wine production increased in the United States particularly in California. As wine was new to most American consumers, they originally focused on white wines, with Chardonnay being the predominant grape used. California's terrain and climate was well suited to grow Chardonnay, and some wineries started to make wines with a grape that garnered international attention. In 1976, 
Harris Plate hosts to a wine tasting between French and California wines, including white burgundies and California Chardonnays. Of the wines being sampled, three of the top four highest rated white wines were from California, with the highest rated one coming from Chateau Montalina in Napa Valley. As the 70s turned into the 80s, taste started to change, and everything got bigger. Big cars, big hair, big villains, big, 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 and wine was no different. To fit with the times, wine producers, especially in California, would dial up certain flavors in their Chardonnays. More residual sugar would be left, making the wine sweeter, and more malolactic fermentation was used, giving the wine stronger butter flavors. The use of oak aging was also increased, cranking up the vanilla and toasty flavors. Winemakers would outdo each other, making bigger and bolder Chardonnays. And if you saw my video on Merlot, you know exactly where this is going. Wine drinkers started to reject these overly sweet, buttery, oaky wines. And while there wasn't a catchphrase from a movie to solidify their distaste for these wines, they did have an acronym. A. B. C. Anything but Chardonnay. Making things worse, this backlash coincided with an overall decline in wine sales. Per capita wine consumption peaked in the United States in 1985 and would continue to decline into the early 90s. While growing disdain for Chardonnay played a role, a larger factor was that the baby boomers, who had fueled increasing wine consumption in the 60s and 70s, were now having children and were cutting back on their alcohol consumption so they could focus on raising their millennial kids. That's one more thing we can blame on millennials. However, this decline in wine consumption would be short-lived. In 1992, the French Paradox study was published, leading to an increase in wine consumption in America that continues to this day. This time, the increase was fueled by red wines, specifically Merlot. But that is another story. In the wake of Chardonnay's decline, other white wines would take the spotlight. Riesling and Sauvignon Blanc, among others, would gain global interest in the 90s and 2000s. As these wines took prominence over Chardonnay, growers around the world replaced their Chardonnay vines with other white varietals. A great example of this is Oregon. Grape growers in the state focused early on Burgundian varieties, and many vineyards extensively planted Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. While Pinot would go on to become the signature grape of Oregon, many Chardonnay vines were replaced with Pinot Gris in the 90s, as growers distanced themselves from this maligned grape. This attitude towards Chardonnay wouldn't remain dominant forever. Sure, there are still many members of the ABC crowd, but during the darkest steps of Chardonnay's popularity, Winemakers would work on improving the quality of their wines and learn some valuable lessons from the overdone wines of the 80s. Growers would work to improve the quality of their grapes, and winemakers would allow for the fruit to take center stage in their wines. They would learn to dial back on malolactic fermentation and oak aging, allowing these tools to accent their wines without overwhelming them. California Shards, once some of the worst offenders, began to produce quality wines that balanced tropical fruit flavors with subtle vanilla and creaminess. And in Oregon, Chardonnay is making a comeback, with growers adding Chardonnay plantings back into their vineyards. And winemakers are making bright wines with peach and pear flavors, representing their difference in climate and terroir. So let's go through some Chardonnays from around the world. We'll start in Burgundy, the French region where the grape got its start. At the northern end of Burgundy, Chablis is known for making some of the finest Chardonnay wines in the world, with bright apple flavors and minerality. This is the 2018 Selection Massal Vie Vigne from Domaine Servan. This bright gold-colored wine has good Macintosh apple and mineral flavors, with hints of sour apple. At the southern end of Burgundy is the Maconnet district. Just north of Beaujolais, this area is also known for its Chardonnay, with the fruit flavors trending more towards pear and lighter tropical fruits. Maconnet is known for its Chardonnays from Puy Fuisse and the various appellations around the town of Macon. This is the 2020 Macon Suitre Puy from Domaine de la Chapelle. From the Macon Villages Appalachian, this is a bright wine with flavors of pineapple and Granny Smith apples, with hints of mango. It does maintain the minerality that Burgundian Chardonnays are known for. Next, we move across the globe to the Margaret River in Western Australia. Nearly 170 miles or 270 kilometers south of Perth at the southwestern corner of the continent, this region's sandy soils and Mediterranean climate make for some excellent Chardonnays. This is the 2021 Miles From Nowhere Chardonnay. This pale colored wine has tropical fruit aromas and pineapple flavors, with hints of mango and vanilla. From the southwestern tip of Australia to the southwestern tip of Africa, we go to the Constantia Valley in South Africa. This suburb of Cape Town is just 30 miles or 50 kilometers north of the Cape of Good Hope, and its location near the Atlantic coast brings constant cool breezes, making for brighter wines. This is the 2018 Baton Chardonnay from Boyton Vervachten. This is a bolder wine that sees a fair amount of oak, 
with vanilla being the predominant flavor, similar to bourbon whiskey. However, this wine has a lot of tropical fruit to balance out the wine. Flavors of mango and papaya are dominant, with hints of creaminess. Despite the big, bold flavors and round body of this wine, it still maintains bright acidity. We move west to the Mendoza region in western Argentina. Better known for red wines like Malbec, Mendoza's location to the east of the Andes Mountains gives the area a warm climate, making for some Chardonnays with ripe fruit flavors. This is the 2019 Catina Chardonnay by Bodega y Catina. It has tropical fruit flavors of mango and pineapple, along with some creamy notes and a round body. This wine also has hints of vanilla. Now we'll look at Chardonnays from some of the diverse wine regions in the United States. First, we go to Paso Robles in the central coast region of California. California was home to some of the most heavily oaked and buttery Chardonnays during the heights of ABC. And while they do make rich wines here, the oak and malolactic fermentation is far more restrained now, allowing for wines that are well balanced. This is the 2020 Dao Chardonnay. This wine leans heavily on tropical fruit flavors, with mango, papaya, and mandarin orange being the most predominant. Hints of cream and vanilla round out this wine. Next, we move north to the Yamhill Carlton Appalachian in the Willamette Valley of Oregon. The Willamette Valley's location east of the coastal range makes for a lot of sunny, summer days. And its northern latitude allows more daylight in each day, while the cool climate makes for brighter wines than is found in California. This is the 2019 Grand Moraine Yamhill Carlton Chardonnay. This wine has flavors of fresh peach, ripe pear, and apricot, with a hint of vanilla. It has bright acidity and even a little minerality, owing to the marine sedimentary soil in Yamhill Carlton. We head east to Seneca Lake and the Finger Lakes of New York State. While better known for its Rieslings, the cold climate of the Finger Lakes region makes for some crisp, bright Chardonnays. This is the 2020 Red Tail Ridge Sands Oak Chardonnay. As you can guess by the name, this wine does not see any oak, allowing the fruit to take center stage. The flavors lean heavily towards apples, with golden delicious and sour apple being predominant, with a hint of white peach. This light-bodied wine is very similar to dry Rieslings in acidity and flavor. Finally, we go down south to the hill country in central Texas. While this state is not known for wine, the High Plains region is starting to make a name for itself with its warm climate wines. This is the 2021 Messina Hoff Private Reserve Chardonnay. They say that everything is bigger in Texas, while the flavors of this wine are certainly big, they are not overdone, with the fruit flavors of apricot and papaya being balanced out with vanilla and cream flavors. So why did Chardonnay get a bad reputation? In short, it became a victim of its own success. It grew rapidly in popularity in the 70s and 80s, and with its ability to serve as a blank canvas for winemakers to add their mark, many of these wines were overdone, leading to the pushback. In the ensuing decades, winemakers learned to balance the flavors of their wine, showcasing the unique characteristics of the grapes grown in each region. Today, Chardonnays can be found in a wide range of styles and flavors, providing options for a variety of tastes. Although the ABC Club still has its members, they are shrinking in number. If you're new to wine or haven't had a Chardonnay in years, give one a try. You might find a wine that becomes your new favorite. These last few months have been pretty amazing. When I started working on the script for this video back in March, this channel had less than 600 subscribers. As I record this, we're now above 6,000. To everyone who joined in the last few months, welcome to the channel. And to those of you who have been subscribers for years, thank you. PevGeek would be nothing without you. I traveled to Oregon back in April, and I got to try a lot of great wines from the Willamette Valley, as well as some great beer and coffee in Portland. I'll be making videos about these in the coming months. Since most of you joined here from the Pilsner video, I'll start with the Portland beer video, which I hope to have out in the next month or two. Subscribe and click the bell to be notified when that and all future videos come out. What are your thoughts about Chardonnay? Are you a member of the ABC Club? If not, what Chardonnays do you like? What is your favorite beverage? Let me know in the comments. Thanks again, and until next time, good night, pleasant dreams, and come again.